Good day. You're listening to European Buddha. It's the 23rd of September and we are still here in Brussels at the AGM meeting, annual gathering, annual gathering meeting of the EBU. <laughs> and we had yesterday a wonderful workshop by the Ikodama group and we were speaking with one of the participants and uh, lecturers in this uh, workshop, Gunnar Ketu. Hello. Hello. And uh, very nice. We said we are sitting right here in the garden uh, of an old uh, monastery and uh, we are speaking about Ekodama and sustainability. And we are very happy that you uh, took your time and willing to do this with us. Well, thank you for... Uh kind of inviting me uh, both to the EBU and to this lovely garden. It just seems uh, just uh, kind of moving to to come, as it were, from out in the sticks in Norway, where I live, in the sticks of Europe, and uh, come here to Brussels, both today at the, as it were, heart of the European Buddhist Union, but also, it's like, through time, like my ancestors will have traveled through Europe to meet, you know, on pilgrimage or to go to Jerusalem or, you know, to other pagan sites. And and then now to sit in this uh, gardens of this cloister or ex-cloister talking with my fellow Buddhists about uh, how to practice the Dharma today. It's uh, amazing. So thank you. Thank you and warmly welcome. Um, what brought you here to this... Um yearly meeting? Well, um, for quite a while I've been interested in sustainability or justice or uh, what my teachers call the new society and, and using the Dharma Buddhism to, to make that happen. But uh, only in August I was given a part-time position from the Norwegian Buddhist Federation to work to promote sustainability amongst Buddhists in Norway and encourage young adults to practice the Dharma. So as soon as I got started, I heard about Jake and the Eco Dharma group in the EBU. And of course, I wanted to know what they're doing and who they are and so forth. And Jake immediately invited me you know, to join this workshop. And immediately, it's just very good to meet these fellow Buddhists who are so interested in the same thing and actually get stuck right in to find out what we do. Um, yeah, so that's that's what brought me here. Thank you. So yesterday we were in the same uh, working group with Martin. Do you remember what we did? Yes, it was a very nice uh, working group and we were encouraged uh, to, to gather around several topics in our topic was um, being in nature and activities in nature, mm. connecting with nature, mm. protecting nature and uh, yeah we had some very nice exchange yeah. So what is the action that you will make when you go back home? Um, I had several ideas in my mind um, I love to camp I love camping mm. and um, Either I will camp alone, would be also an action, or inspire people mm -hmm. to, to come with me. Because uh, if you have less resources and all your senses, I think it's a very nice uh, way to connect with nature. You understand how little you actually need and you have enough. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Something we forget when we're in busy city lives. What was your inspiration after this? My inspiration was um, to go and swim in open waters uh, because in Finland the waters are in quite bad shape, especially the Baltic Sea. And it would be good to people to really get to understand what the situation is and to encourage to make uh, actions to make it better. Uh -huh. That's something. Also just being silent in nature is something that I really would like to encourage people to do. Um, just being silent in the nature. It can happen if we go to nature, we have a very loud talk and we forget that we're actually um, going into somebody's home that is living in the nature or the birds and, and 
other animals there. So how to get to respect. And I think that was one of the reasons also for this uh, exercise to connect with nature because when you connect and you understand that you want to protect it mm. and uh, we are part of the nature and we do not want to harm mm. ourselves mm. or others mm. as well mm. so it was really nice reminder of mm. important things in life mm. yeah. yeah and uh, Gunnar you you or I just called you just Gunnar it, do people call you Gunnar? Yeah, some people, some people, most people, I think, uh, uh, think that uh, since uh, Gunnar Ketu is a strange name, and then they find out that I'm ordained to the Chiratna Buddhist order, and then it's kind of, Ooh, uh, we must better respect this fella, this strange fella, and then make sure that we pronounce his name right. Uh, but I'm pleased to hear that you feel free to say just Gunnar. <laughs> and what does it mean? Well, Guna uh, is a Sanskrit name, uh, means something like precious or something uh, valuable. So, you know, if you call me precious, you know, that's uh, okay. Yeah. And, My uh, precious. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not in that sense, but hey. Uh, um, and then Ketu is a comet or a fire, or so the initial meaning uh, my preceptor drew out was that of a precious flame. Mm. And I very much like the image like when I'm meditating and just seeing or lighting a candle in front of the Buddha so that I can be that candle lighting up the Buddha um, and then uh, he pulled out and the secondary meaning apparently that could mean he who carries the banner of victory and I think that is in a sense it's, it's coming more to the foreground as I'm uh, you know now leaning even more into this uh, engaged Buddhism or the eco-dharma and really, you know, it's just so delightful to hear about your inspiration from the workshop and, you know, like your love of camping and, you know, going swimming in the wild and you want to encourage people to do that. And so then to, to lead people or facilitate people or even tell people that it is possible to swim in the wild or to go camping. And to loads of people these days, they don't know how. And I think this is so sad because, as, as you said, um, if you don't love nature or care about nature, you're not going to protect it. Okay. And so, so really taking that to heart and then uh, meeting people at their different levels so that with with you fellows, you know, we might go camping together and we just naturally know how to build fires and mm. you may set up tents or hammocks and just survive. Mm. Uh, and that's great. Mm. Let's do that. And then there are all these other people who were never exposed to that. So, so they don't know how to do that. And they don't know how to be comfortable. And, you know, you need to make, bring a mosquito net if you're going to meditate in the forest in Norway in the summer. And, you know, all these things, you know, because with that, it's really too tough. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that are kind of, uh, you know, being part. And sometimes, occasionally, I've been in demonstrations and people will go under a banner. So mm -hmm. this idea of being, you know, now with the Eco Dharma group in the EBU under the banner of actually, yeah, Eco Dharma, let's uh, make uh, the Dharma fused with sustainability and join that massive um, train of people going through the world at the moment. Because apparently, according to one writer, the biggest social movement in the history ever is that of people uh, joining together under sustainability and justice. Mm -hmm. But they're not organized under one organization, so that's why you won't see them as that big organization. But if you search you know, on that term, that is mobilizing an incredible number of people. So to join, to join that you know, and have a banner in that train, that I find very inspiring. That's great. And... Uh, I remember a very nice story you told yesterday at the dinner. Um, it's a, a bit about activism. Uh, when the Christmas is coming and shopping centers are full of stuff and people shopping. So you had Santa Claus as sitting on meditation in the uh, mall. Can you say a few words about this? Yeah, so uh, coming from the precept of living simply, 
and of course not taken and not given because uh, taking that uh, original Buddhist insight that you know things they're not going to make us happy and of course modern science has also discovered that the last 40 years that most of us in the West we have so many things that more things isn't going to make us happy so why do we want to give each other this stuff so to really to bring this to people's awareness you know a number of us and we teamed with another large uh, organization in Norway called the future in our hands that are also working towards the same aim and decided to make uh, a stunt. Uh, and so, yeah, a number of us, I think in one year we were seven, maybe the other year we were but, uh, maybe slightly more. All dressed. Maybe next year we're going to be thousands of us <laughs> <laughs> around Europe. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that would be, that would be beautiful. <laughs> and so then we would uh, just go into shopping malls and, and sit down by an escalator or somewhere, uh, you know, a group, most people just sitting there and the one person with leaflets handing out so you know, postcards just explaining briefly what we're on suggest suggestions for alternative gifts for Christmas and you know how they could get in touch and we would be there for maybe 10-15 minutes until the security <laughs> guard came and wondered where, what we were and if we were actually going to buy something and if you could please leave <laughs> And at one point, uh, we weren't even able to sit down before the three security guards were saying, you're not buying anything, you're out of here. <laughs> so but it, was, it was fun. Yes. Uh, but it's just one great example of what you can actually do. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. let's share these experiences when, we, when we're doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and I think keeping it light and funny. Yes. Because I think there's ideas that were maybe... Uh, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there's street parties. Mm -hmm. R rather than just blocking a street, you organize a street party and have fun and invite all kinds of neighbors mm -hmm. to join in, and, you know, to, ha to maintain that spirit mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, usually when people also hear about um, sustainability, it's like, oh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. I have to um, hold back, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it's really nice uh, um, to fuel that with inspiration mm -hmm. and also coming together. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were telling me about like ideas in the future for a camp, something like this together mm -hmm. under the topic of sustainability and to experience what it is actually about mm -hmm. and could be light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, first of all, I, I, I need, really need to mention this magazine, Positive News, from the UK, which is now uh, such a delightful source of inspiration about all the good things that people are doing around the world. And so uh, you, one of the things that is close to my heart and what you talked about this living in nature, you know, we'd like to, to create a, a retreat center um, and go on retreats with people into nature. And a friend of mine, Guru Pati, uh, many years ago established Eco Dharma in uh, Catalonia area in Spain, where people could come into a really remote part of the mountain, live very simply, uh, cultivate the, uh, the land, be together in silence and talking, and be inspired. And at the moment, they are focusing more on going out to activist groups to teach meditation and communication with them. But I'm, I really, I missed going to the Eco Dharma retreat center. So now I'm here at the EBU. I've been looking around, you know, is there anything like that happening? Mm -hmm. And so far I haven't found it. But we, are, we have a very small retreat center in Norway, just outside of Oslo, um, that, that we want to put on some of these retreats. And we are thinking, well, if there isn't much in, in Europe, then invite, you know, a larger audience, maybe... For some people, you know, to be there, but and and experiment with the possibility of doing it hybrid, because uh, my partner Anna, she's also uh, teaching uh, students of all kinds of uh, different schools how to enjoy nature, and so even though we say ten of us gather in a retreat at Skugli at this retreat place, you know, and we meditate together indoors or outdoors and do exercises like slow walking in nature like these mindful walks and one way we're doing it we're going in a line and, and Martin maybe you go first and so you just walk and whatever catches your eye 
you just stop and maybe look at that tree stump mm -hmm. and we all gather around silently and and so this is what you noticed and so then I look ah why did Martin notice that ah, ah see that's beautiful mm -hmm. then after a while you know you step back and then maybe I take the lead and so I stroll on and until something else catches my eye and I stop and so we do that and and so those are kind of exercises then we could also inspire people who are there online to do their own exercises like Anna was doing one of these workshops that she was used to do in nature and now it had to be online globally and so she was going to do this with people from Dubai you know <laughs> indoor climate and oh. like so well find something living <laughs> and they had a pot plant and oh. so they went over and they, they, they looked and really looked at that palm as it was so inspiring both for that student and for Anna. So it's possible. We just have to be creative. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so much um, in the spirit of sustainability that we have to be, you know, uh, creative and playful, um, at least uh, when we can, at least part of it. Mm -hmm. oh, and then, of course, comes the other, the other work, very much inspired by John and Macy, of actually also embracing the sadness. Mm -hmm. And I think learning again to hold you know the sadness the grief and the pain and even our own traumas uh, on 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 my last long retreat i had this moment you know i was was um, kind of supervising someone was really going through such a hard time they had to leave the retreat and this terrible story and i was really i was sitting there in the morning and really taking this grief and i was just just so dark inside you know I, I knew there was meta there mm. I just I couldn't experience it it just just wasn't there I, I couldn't and I looked all around as you know as my inside practice and I saw the world was just going about its business not caring what, what I felt or didn't feel so it's this kind of I was just a blip in the universe and so then but now okay so I finished the meditation and I knew okay I'd like to connect. And so I went out into the forest knowing that the chances are I'll somehow connect. And then after a while I look up at the tree and I see this squirrel having this um, cone running up the tree, sitting on a branch quite high up. And the first time it sits there looking at me and me mm. looking at it. And it starts eating this cone whilst looking at me. And so this is a connection with nature, and I was just, I'm still moved when thinking about it. Mm. And then suddenly that whole darkness, it just disappears, like, like clouds separating. And, you know, the meta is flowing, and I'm with the universe. And, and so, so, so having those kind of experiences and knowing how to access it is, is something that is so needed, mm. and it, you, it needs to be taught for most people. Because sometimes by chance you will drop into these experiences but if you're not trained to appreciate them it's just ah that happened mm. this morning I also saw a squirrel it was really lighting up the day <laughs> so I can connect <laughs> so to, to that there are some squirrels here yeah. yeah so what would you say is um, or let's put it another way yesterday you showed us a very nice picture of uh, I think um, of your a uh, homeland, so to speak. Lakes, snow. Lakes, and with a banner, um, Tibetan flag banner there. And um, for me, it was like you bring the nature into this room mm. already. Mm. So can you say something about your your homeland, uh, where where you're from, actually? Mm. Yeah, my, my great-grandfather was the uh, eldest son, son of a small farm. Uh, in this area and he didn't want to take on the farm so he wanted rather to you know be the supervisor of a small uh, sawmill uh, you know by by the lake and so he uh, exchanged his um, as where well so so he let the the farm go to his brother and he had just a piece of land that he he could have And then when he started working for the municipality in this sawmill, he could exchange that piece of land for a piece of land next to this lake. 
And so then he was working in this sawmill and building a house on this lake. And and I'm not... I kind of... Occasionally, I, I really want to know how far back, you know, this generation goes at that land but as far as I'm concerned in the sense that is where I'm from <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, but, um, so my great grandfather had this piece of land with the house uh, quite a large piece of land and then during the second world war my grandmother his daughter uh, my great grandfather's uh, daughter was living in Oslo uh, working at the university but during the second world war in particular I think there was a great uh, explosion and the, the resistant movement was getting more active. So, And she was, to some extent, involved in that uh, movement. And I think she became scared. I never talked to her about this. I constructed this story later. And so they, sh they asked if they could have a little piece of land from my great-grandfather's and, and to build a hut, and mm. which they did. And so that's kind of where I grew up in the summers, in this little cottage by this lake, you know, just having wonderful uh, experiences out swimming in the lake, mm. you know, looking at squirrels, playing, you know, uh, hunters and whatnot. Um, and uh, as I was growing up, I really felt very fortunate. And I was, and already before becoming a Buddhist, the sense of, wanting to share that somehow mm -hmm. and so w when I became a Buddhist I started uh, doing my solitary retreats there and we organized a few you know small retreats and uh, at that one point we thought and when I moved back to Norway from Manchester you know looking at this small garage that was there full of junk I said well we could turn that into a small meditation hall and so then we had a little community gathering and so we converted that into a meditation mm -hmm. hall a couple of friends from Finland came over and had to lay <laughs> the flooring in particular and so then uh, so then we did that and uh, a while later we were looking at this old boathouse so we thought well we could turn that into a small dormitory <laughs> and so we did and so now we can house 10 people 10 people can sleep there and meditate you know for small retreats Wow. And so that's where, uh, you know, that, you know, having that, that precious kind of piece of land that, you know, isn't big enough to grow a forest like Jake told about, but at least we grow some vegetables there and flowers mm. for the shrine, uh, you know, and then, you know, offer that to more people. So, now, so then we have that, this contract that the Oslo Buddhist Center is, as it were, responsible for a third. Mm. So they, they could use it for retreats for you know a third of the time and my sister and I you know um, use divide also a third each and then uh, they also take part in the maintenance so yeah. this kind of partnering up as we add into society to share our resources I think that's you know, is really mm -hmm. a way to go and so to find ways to do that locally mm -hmm. you know not dream about some distant future but do it now yeah yeah, maybe this is also something uh, for the our listeners to discover. Uh, where is your favorite spot in nature? And maybe we have listeners who live in the city, uh, but uh, you can go in the park. And maybe yeah. you have a favorite spot there and just uh, sit there and do it maybe regularly every day or every week and go with the seasons and see what's happening there, what's changing there. This could be a this is a, one of a teaching I received for people who even live in the cities to connect because in the city sometimes it's not that uh, easy mm. but find your nature spot and come there regularly and for some people that are not able to actually go outside you can maybe have a home plant that mm. you really take care of and talk to and yes yeah <laughs> And, and of course, uh, research from you know uh, hospitals and uh, care homes, you know, very much support that. If mm. you know patients who are given a, a plan to look after, you mm. know, actually speeds their recovery. And I think also because I think in this world of sustainability, depending on your view of the world, I think it's important to feel that you can do something because it's easy to be overwhelmed and think, well. I can't control uh, the oil industry. You know, I can't uh, do this, that, and the other. 
but what you can do, there's always something you can do. And so you might find your local park or a corner of your park that you find you like to go there and then take responsibility for it. You know, remove litter, you know, maybe water some, maybe even you go and plant some flowers, even though no one's given you, you allowed you to do that, just do that. Just to look, take care of your little corner of the universe. Mm-hmm. And, and know that that's your bit and go there as you said enjoy it yeah this we all can do yeah. <laughs> and I really like this uh, energy you just uh, presented from the workshop yesterday yeah. um, it was really raising uh, ideas and then uh, committing to that what will yes. you do What? Yeah. Uh, so it was really uh, encouraging me uh, from a passive state into an active mm-hmm. state and as you said um, every uh, everybody can do something, mm. and let's do it. Mm. And uh, I recognize, uh, oh, I have to go out of my passive behavior, mm. and uh, it's so easy actually. Mm. Yeah. And in in one of the groups, of course, and and uh, uh, frequent response is, well, I can't change the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so it's like this step is far too big mm. yeah. and and just stop it's like this we do this in meditation all the time you start mm. thinking about something else other than the breath or whatever and just mm. just, just pause and say ah does is it true it, does the step have to be that big no that was just a thought mm. ah let's think again so can I take a small step mm. and this could of course be you know looking cleaning out the park or mm. talking to your neighbor or mm. something yeah Small steps are good steps. Small steps are good steps. Very good. Small steps are good steps. So I think we're coming to an end. Um, and um, Emilia, you will have the last words. Yes, thank you for taking this break with us. Thank you for reminding us of our roots and how to take care of it, them <laughs> and us. Thank you. Th- thank, thank you, and um, well, well, really, thank you, thank you for uh, letting me remind you. And I also it was like one of my current actions, you know, that I took myself and I signed up in the workshop myself. Is this? Oh, it's like a eco Buddhist training, or even like an eco sattva training, you know, to as I said before. And as I think we all appreciate the need for training, you know, in the, in the, if you're going to awaken, we need training, you know, that we take from the Buddha. So also engage in in some kind of training to to find out how to combine your Dharma practice and your Dharma training with sensible, sustainable activities. And so yeah, so look for for that kind of training. And see you there. Let's connect. Thank you very much. Thank you.